Good afternoon. Uh, again, I'm, I'm John Brayo. Uh, I'm with the National Consumers League here. I wanted to thank all of you again for, uh, for coming and, and I think uh, listening to what we, was a great opening panel of the day. Um, we have a, 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 our keynote session coming up now and I think it's going to be just as interesting. Um, our keynote session is going to be moderated uh, by Michael Kaiser and uh, he'll be uh, having a, uh, what we're calling a fireside chat with uh, FTC Chairwoman Edith Ramirez and former FTC Chairwoman uh, Debbie Platt Majoris. Um, just as a brief introduction to Michael, he's the Executive Director of the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Uh, he joined NCSA in 2008. Um, at NCSA, he engages diverse communities, business, government, and other nonprofit organizations in NCSA's broad public education and outreach efforts to strengthen the nation's cyber infrastructure, including leadership of NCSA's premier outreach and awareness campaign, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. NCSA builds efforts through public-private partnerships that address cybersecurity issues for home users, K through 12 and higher education, and small business. He serves on the Department of Commerce, NTIA, Department of Commerce NTIA's Online Safety Technology Working Group, and was named one of SC Magazine's Information Security Luminaries of 2009. So Michael will be introducing uh, Chairman Ramirez and W. Majoris. So take it away, guys. It's kind of hard to see up here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, NCL, for having us uh, in today. I think this is going to be a really great conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. I want to start a little bit with just some introductions. We have really uh, two very honored guests here today, and I think we have an opportunity to have a really interesting conversation. And I'm very excited about that, and we want to get right into it. But first, um, let me do just some quick introductions of our uh, panel. So uh, on, our, on my far left, I guess, uh, is the Honorable Edith Ramirez, the Chairwoman of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, Ms. Ramirez was sworn in as a Commissioner of the Federal Trade Commissioner uh, in April of 2010 to a term that expires in 2015. She was designated to serve as the Chairwoman of the FTC effective March 2013 by President Obama. Prior to joining the Commission, Ms. Ramirez was a partner in the Los Angeles office of Quinn, Emanuel, Urquhart, and Sullivan, where she handled a broad range of complex business litigation, including uh, representing clients in IP, antitrust, unfair competition, and other things, uh, and she has extensive appellate litigation experience. And on my near left is, the, is Deborah Majoris, the former chairwoman of the Federal Trade Commission and currently the secretary, chief legal officer, excuse me, and secretary at Procter & Gamble. Uh, Deborah, Debbie was, uh, is currently uh, doing those things at Procter & Gamble. Uh, prior to joining P&G, she served as the chairwoman of the Federal Trade Commission from 2004 to 2008 uh, and was appointed on May 11, 2004 by George W. B Bush. During her tenure as head of the FTC, the Identity Task Force, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, during this discussion, was established, uh, launching a new effort to combat identity theft and before returning to public service, uh, Debbie was a partner at Jones Day in Washington, where she worked on a variety of antitrust counseling and civil litigation and criminal litigation matters. So now we've dispensed with the formalities. <laughs> we can get to the, to the more interesting part of the conversation. But I one quick uh, housekeeping note. Um, we will be taking questions. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session here uh, toward the end. Uh, if you want, there are cards. You can write your question down. Uh, you can raise your hand. I'm told that a, an NCL runner will come and pick up that question from you, uh, and they will be brought to the front, and we'll try to get in uh, as many questions as we can toward the end of the session. I think uh, your questions are obviously a very important part of the discussion, and we want to hear them. So let's jump right in, and let's have some discussion about identity theft. We'll start kind of broad, uh, if you don't mind. Um, you know, uh, Research uh, has showed us, and from a lot of different sources, in fact, research that the National Cybersecurity Alliance has done as well, is that uh, consumers remain very worried about this issue of identity theft. I think when we talk to them and others talk to them, the risks of losing information that might lead to some kind of a financial loss, whether they call it identity theft or not, is very, very important to them. Uh, today, as a matter of fact, the Bureau of Justice Assistance or Bureau of Justice Statistics at DOJ just released their report from their victimization survey that indicated, uh, I think, 16.6 million people were victims of ID theft in 2012. It's a pretty big number. There was some discussion of that earlier uh, in the panel about some of those numbers. Um, so 
when we think about the concerns that people have about security, their personal data in general, um, about identity theft in particular, just in general, what kind of progress have we made on this issue? And I'll just throw that out to the both of you for starters. Well, I think, look, I think we have made progress over time, but I think that what happens is it's a little bit like playing the whack-a-mole, that when you close off certain avenues um, for um, people to commit identity theft, they find new avenues. Um, so, um, so uh, you know, the 16 uh, million number is very, very troubling. The key is to, to, to drill down into it and find out, well, what's actually happening and what kind of theft theft is this really? If you, so if you look, for example, um, you know, I was very interested as I got back into this subject um, to come here today to, to see, you know, not in a good way, but to see how some of this has shifted. So whereas stealing social security numbers and credit card numbers and committing fraud that way was what we were really very concerned about several years ago when I had the pleasure to work at the FTC. Um, that's, I'm not saying that still doesn't happen, it obviously does, but that's not, that tends, if you look at the statistics, not to be the growing areas, not to be the areas that are, um, that are, that are as much on people's minds, and the reason is because I do believe progress was made on multiple fronts. And, and, and to that I would say it has to be made on multiple fronts. There's just absolutely no way to make progress without all of the all of the um, constituents. You know, I think starting with consumers, and I think consumers um, have gotten better at certain things, not giving up their social security numbers quite so easily, perhaps, um, learning how to protect credit cards, knowing what to do if a credit card gets out of their hands, and, and some of those sorts of things. And I also think that um, first responders have gotten a little bit better at dealing with these, and so we've put in processes in place. The pro the problem, though, is as we've tried to create a culture where everybody th thinks harder about, you know, about what the next thing could be, unfortunately, I think, you know, that's probably where there's still work for all of us to be doing. And I say all of us because I include the private sector absolutely in, you know, being part of the solution to all of this. during your tenure and, and the work that was done under your leadership, um, both with the task force on ID theft um, and, and the laying the foundation. And what I mean by that is that I think um, there is better coordination among um, federal agencies, um, among state and local enforcers to attempt to tackle the problem. I think we also have done um, now a better job of outreach and educating consumers about how to both uh, protect their information to prevent ID theft as well as how to go about dealing with um, the problem of ID theft when they do become victims. Um, so I think while the problem remains significant and it, it is evolving and morphing and we see new trends, um, I think that we are um, better equipped to handle it both in terms of prevention, um, providing victim assistance. I think that's an area where there's been a significant expansion um, that includes work that we do with the FTC. We have, of course, um, as, as I'm sure all the folks in this room are aware, a hotline where we have trained counselors that are devoted to this issue who can provide guidance. We have significant guidance on, available online on our website. Um, and in addition to that, we are also leveraging our experience and expertise by also training um, community organ organizers, legal services agencies in particular, to, so that they can in turn um, help and assist consumers in this area. So even though I think the problem continues and continues to be significant, and I don't want to downplay its importance, I think we have the, the networks in place, I think we have the personal relationships in place um, at the governmental level as well as with uh, uh, the private sector. And we have the experience and knowledge base to tackle this in a concerted way, more effective way. But there's no question that, that more needs to be done and that we need to be more effective and smarter in how we go about tackling the problem. And I think the, you know, the issues around education and victim assistance 
and, and, and all the great work that's been done there that you mentioned. It's so critical because I do remember when we used to talk to consumers about this issue, and they talked about how they were really feeling like they were victimized twice, right? So first, obviously, by the crime of um, having an identity or, um, or some form of PII stolen. But then second, when they actually tried to get help, and they just couldn't seem to find it. And, and you know, um, if you call your police department or, and they're saying, what are you talking about? You know, I'm not concerned about that. So I think that's, um, that's a key, key area in terms of progress. Great, yeah, I think uh, that's great. So um, let's just jump back a little bit, uh, since we have the really, you know, we kind of have a, a rare, uh, a wealth of riches here on the stage this morning, both looking back and, you know, from things that have happened in the past and the present and the future. So Debbie, you know, um, identity theft has been a top consumer complaint at the FTC for 13 years, long time. And President Bush uh, made addressing it a priority with the creation of the task force in 2006. And what do you think some of the legacy of that? What do you think some of the reforms or the most important reforms that the task force achieved, um, you know, as we look at sort of, sort of that a foundational change in the issue back then? Yeah, it was, it was a, it, I think it was a great effort because it really, it really, um, it really amplified the issue. Um, because if, again, back then, even if you looked at what consumers were concerned about, you know, I remember seeing some surveys where it was sort of, you know, Identity theft was up here and terrorist threat was, was down there. Now some of that's just because you're more likely to be victimized by identity theft, but, uh, but nonetheless. So, um, so, so that was important. I'm going I'm to actually step back a little bit further even, though, um, and give um, Tim Uris and then the great um, staff at the FTC a lot of credit here because that's where a lot of the work that eventually the task force took on and amplified and added to started. Um, really was, I'm not saying it wasn't in other agencies, it was, it was dispersed. But the FTC in particular started really to show some leadership in this area under Tim Uris. And, um, and I think that, um, and, and the timing turned out to, to be good because um, we started to have really high profile data breaches in, in 04, 05. And that really, um, you know, began a conversation in the media and elsewhere, which of course consumers were responding to and feeling very, very nervous about. And so I think that, um, uh, you know, there's, there's been talk about comprehensive privacy legislation for a long time, about data breach legislation then during that time. And on a national level, that still has yet to happen. But what the FTC was able to do was use the authority it had, which I understand is being challenged today by a couple of cases, but use the authority that we had to try to set reasonable standards for data security for companies because there was a void and that was the void we thought was harming our consumers in this country. Quite frankly, it was also putting us in poor stead around the world because it looked like from the outside, okay, other countries are jumping into this and, and, and what are they doing in the US. So there was a lot of good work that was done there in terms of starting to bring cases against companies um, for deceiving consumers, but also if the, if the data security measures were so poor that it was just considered to be an unfair practice. And so those cases, what you really want to accomplish is to start setting a standard. And I think that was a really important uh, important, important thing to have done that really extends. And then the other really component pieces are ones that that, um, that Edith mentioned. The education piece, which I see Carolyn here, and and um, she was instrumental in that, and uh, with with her great team. And then also just just getting first responders to understand this as the crime that it is. So then what happened was. Um, uh, you know, folks in domestic policy and the administration and so forth said, can we help? Can we help to amplify this? And of course, you know, anybody who's at the FTC knows, it's a pretty small agency by federal standards, and so you have to leverage what you can. And we were delighted to have a broader, plat a broader platform um, and also to get more uh, intra-agency coordination um, because it's, it's a crime and the FTC doesn't prosecute crimes. So that's sort of how, how so it kind of evolved. And then, um, and then the task force was able um, to really look at the issue holistically. And we've mentioned some of the progress that some of which I think the task force helped move along. But one of the, thing, one of the things I will mention about progress from the task force um, 
was thinking about the federal government itself has enormous amounts of data <laughs> um, and practices that um, like the use of social security numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and so we really, we really looked at um, ourselves. And by that point, the FTC, we had realized that we needed to do a better job ourselves, right? I mean, you hate to be out saying, oh, thou shall, and thou shall not, and then, you know, what are you doing inside? So we had appointed the chief privacy officer and really started putting in place our own measures. Um, and, then, um, and then we really worked with other federal agencies to do that. So I think even just getting that house in order, and if you see today that some of the identity threat theft that's medical in nature that's tax related and you know that is also victimizing the federal government so I think that piece was really important and recognizing that piece um, and then just being able to strengthen the coordination and strengthen some of the enforcement mechanisms and then to, to be wider spread in our educational efforts I think I think all of that was um, was a was a was a good strong effort Great. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're huge fans of On Guard Online, you know, by the way. It's a really important educational resource, very trusted resource in, in the field uh, on these issues. So, um, Chairman Ramirez, you know, um, that, that's a little bit of the past, right? But there's a lot of things going on right now. Would you want to help sort of educate people about how the federal government, you know, not just within the FTC, but even more broadly might be looking at these issues? Sure, and, and it builds on exactly what um, Debbie was just talking about. Um, today, um, there's a, a task force that meets monthly, and it's led by the Department of Justice. It includes the FBI, Secret Service, folks from the uh, Postal Service as well, um, among other um, enforcers. And we, of course, also at the FTC are very active in it. And, and the focus is really to, to, every month, talk through what are um, folks seeing on the ground? What are the emerging trends? How is this evolving? How do we tackle it? What are strategies uh, for prosecuting these crimes? Um, so that's happening on a, on a regular basis, um, and there's quite a bit of coordination at that level. Um, in addition, there's been a very significant effort to train state and local law enforcers in how to tackle and prosecute these crimes. Um, I think the figure, if I'm rem remembering correctly, is that um, uh, over 5,600 um, law enforcers across the country have been trained from uh, just a huge number of different um, local and state agencies. So that's been a very important effort. Um, the other um, thing that I want to mention, and, and also uh, touching on a point that Debbie made about how it was important to look at ourselves, um, not just within the FTC, but the federal government as a whole. Um, the FTC during this time also issued a report about how frequently social security numbers were being used as an identifier. And that in turn, the more that it's used, that in turn opens up and, and uh, creates a greater risk that that information will get out and can then be used um, uh, for fraudulent purposes. And as a consequence, I think, of, of the FTC elevating this issue and issuing that report, um, I think there's been a reduced use of social security numbers in the federal government, in particular um, in the military. Um, they made a point of no, you know, reducing the need to be using the social security number as an identifier. I think more still needs to be done in that area, um, out in, certainly in the commercial sector, um, but that was an issue um, that uh, the FTC focused on, and I think it's an important one. Um, so there, I think we have made some, some progress. Um, let me also just mention that um, today, what we're also doing is that we're taking a closer look at particular types of ID theft, taking a deeper dive and, and getting a greater understanding of the challenges that particular uh, parts of the population might be facing. That includes um, children, for instance. Um, children generally, because we do and have seen a spike in um, the number of victims um, uh, uh, when it comes to children. We're also, there's a special, um, paying special attention to foster youth who are particularly vulnerable. Seniors, um, they are another part of the population that um, while we haven't seen a greater incidence of senior ID theft, there are particular challenges in dealing with this issue and there's a greater um, vulnerability there. And so we've, we um, held a, a workshop on the issue um, this, over the past year and brought together 
um, a number of different folks, including AARP, other law enforcers, to um, try to see how we can better tackle um, this issue. Um, in addition, we've also been um, uh, focusing on what is one of the more recent trends that we've seen, which is tax ID um, theft. And as a matter of fact, um, the agency um, is spearheading um, an awareness week, the week of January 13th. Um, so it's just, it's coming up around the corner um, where we're doing um, national and regional events um, that include webinars, workshops, talks, um, uh, and have particular events in the states where, where this is more, you know, more of an issue. Um, and we've seen a huge spike actually in Florida and in South Florida in particular, and I don't know if some of you may have seen um, some media reports about some of the efforts that um, federal and local um, law enforcers are making in, in South Florida. I think over the last year, um, they've charged more than 270 defendants trying to get these various rings that are aimed at um, uh, stealing um, people's identities and then using it to claim um, tax refunds. So, so these are new problems that we're seeing, and I do think that we are um, better equipped today in confronting them, even though challenges remain. Right, right. Uh, we're, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about some of these emerging issues too. I think because I think that is part of part of the landscape that we have to you know we have to we have to grapple with. But I want to go back to. Um, you know, a little bit um, to some of the, to one of the recommendations that came out of the task force, which is, um, you know, I like to say that, uh, you know, data is the coin of the realm in cybercrime, right? I mean, that's what people are stealing uh, first and foremost. Um, and coming from data breaches or other kinds of losses. Um, so one of the key recommendations of the task force was that there be a national data breach notification standard. Um, 46 states have passed a breach, some kind of breach notification law at this point, but we haven't had a federal law. Um, do we still need that? Um, would it better protect com com uh, consumers if we had that kind of um, law or standard? We can start here. Since you were, came out of your, you know, out of that, yeah, you know. Yeah, it did. Well, the FTC um, took, took the position that we should, and then the task force uh, took the position and today, in my private role, I would still take the position. Um, uh, not that I'm not always consistent on everything. I <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but um, look, you know, one of the reasons that we thought it was important and necessary not only remains, but it, it's been borne out, which is if you don't have a national standard, you will have separate standards for separate states, which makes it enormously difficult for those of us in organizations, should we have to, uh, should we be subject to it? So I think just quite simply, um, it would be, and, 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 and I assume that consumers can be better protected if we have a consistent standard, because it's, 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 we can be better, stronger, faster if we have to in, 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 uh, in following it and, and getting them the information that, that they need. Um, but a couple of things, you know, are important, I mean, to state, what, what may be obvious, but is a very, very difficult question when you're passing federal legislation, which is if you don't preempt the state laws, then how much good does it really do at this point? I mean, because I think one of the main reasons to have it is um, it's not to patch those remaining four states, it's to have that consistency. So, and that's a very difficult legislative issue. Uh, so, so I don't know whether it can happen. And then the other thing I would say is um, I, I looked at, uh, uh, the, the white paper that NCL put out today, which I think makes some very, very good points. But one thing, though, that it said about this was, you know, um, and, and I recognize that the, um, that the paper, um, you know, you, you can't put in every single detail of what, of what you want, but it said use the most stringent um, of the state laws. And um, I think I would, I, the way I would put it is, um, if you can, truly use the states as a crucible of democracy and use the most effective one, if you can, if, if you can figure that out, as opposed, because the, I don't know what, exactly what the most stringent means, and that may not be the best one, particularly if it means that you over-notice, because we've always worried about the issue of sending too many notices to consumers so that they'll do one of two things, the second being, I think, more likely. One is panicking when there's nothing to worry about because there really isn't a reasonable chance of harm but more probably worse is 
just getting jaded to it. Like, ugh, oh, another one of these notices. I get these all the time. Nothing ever bad happens. And so when there's one that needs to be taken more seriously, it doesn't happen. So that's my thinking on that. Yeah, I think I mean, my view is, is very consistent with um, what Debbie just stated. Um, number one, I think it's important that we do have a, a good, you know, sh uh, robust uh, standard at the federal level. Um, and additionally, I think the reason that it w the second reason that it would be beneficial is that um, um, I'd like to see FTC be the the enforcer. So if you have FTC enforcement along with um, state concurrent uh, jurisdiction to enforce, I think that would be uh, an absolute benefit. And I think it's something something that we've continued um, to push for. And, and I was actually um, testifying on the Hill recently and, and made uh, and yet another push for that. Um, but so I hope that we, we do see that because um, there's no question that on, when it comes to efforts to prevent ID theft, um, there needs to be more work both with regard to making sure there's effective notification to consumers so that they can take appropriate steps, but also, um, and, and Debbie, you already touched on this, um, just um, dealing with data breaches. Um, generally, ha we need to ensure that companies who have um, personal data are doing what they can to protect that information. Um, and that's really quite critical, and so um, I also, um, and pushing for there to be a, a, you know, data security um, legislation um, that also would give authority to the FTC, including um, civil penalty authority in this area. Um, and I really um, have to give a lot of credit um, both to Tim Muris, who did um, really start these efforts um, at the FTC, and then also to, to Debbie, who um, created a, a unit focusing on these issues, focusing on privacy, focusing on identity protection at the FTC. And now, of course, the work that we do in this area is just incredibly Im important. Great. Thanks. Just a reminder uh, about if you have a question, write it on a card, raise your hand, and somebody will come and, and pick it up. Um, actually, this, this is a topic, and I'm going to address this question, you, uh, Debbie, to start with. Um, that actually came up a little bit earlier in the earlier panel a little bit. There was some discussion about uh, the limiting of consumer liability mm -hmm. around fraudulent activity, credit card debt, debit purchase, and the like. Um, and that actually, you know, some people say that's been a driver around, you know, bigger investments, for example, in the private sector and fraud prevention and, and those kinds of things because of where the risk can be shifted, right, um, in, in that kind of way. So you've been both on the public and the private side here um, and uh, now with P&G. Um, and obviously, data security very hot topic these days. Uh, we, you know, it, and and the correlation. We'll talk about this a little bit later. The correlation between security and privacy also very important. So, do we need to look at um, some other incentives in the private sector to better, even better, protect the uh, large amounts of data that's being collected? Um, and and really on the, you know. Um, yeah. Um, I think the first thing that I would want to know um, if I were if, if I were looking you know whether legislation of some kind to incent the private sector more were necessary is I'd really want to understand um, better um, as to the extent we can um, what the um, you know what kinds of ID theft are, are we seeing what kind of data um, security breaches are we seeing in other words what's the you know what's the what's the diagnosis? I'd want to be pretty clear about what the diagnosis is, and then try to as surgically as possible, um, you know, zero in on those things. And you know, for a couple of reasons in this space, one is, um, you know, is a world of limited government resources. I know I always used to look at where the private sector was already incented to do certain things, you know, just quite naturally. Mm -hmm. And I think in this area. Certainly, a company like ours, um, uh, you know, we, we have enormous incentives, and and the general counsels I talk to, it's it's a huge topic of conversation for all of our companies, because um, first of all, um, you know, our reputation with consumers matters a great deal, um, uh, and uh, and we know that if consumers stop trusting us, um, in fact, I saw I, when I was reading the. Um, the Poneman survey of um, trusted consumers in the privacy, of, of which companies consumers trust in the privacy space. It's so hard for me to get behind that and wonder if it's the overall trust they have in your company. 
versus really knowing what you do in privacy. Um, but either way, right, it matters a whole heck of a lot. So, and then there's the, when you really start getting into the true cyber threats, which are, I don't know if you've ever had briefings on this from the people who do it, you know, like our head of security at Procter, whatever, but you just sit there and it's, it's like mind boggling what the threats are these days. And so the threat there is not only to your reputation with consumers as a company, it's could you have an absolute, you know, could you have a catastrophic event that breaks down your, um, you know, your business? So, um, so, so it's, it's tough because I do think we already have a lot of incentives in this space. And so, um, so again, I'd want to know what the problem is before I said, yes, there's a need, there's a need, there's a need for greater. And I guess the other thing that occurs to me as I think about this, because I do understand the analogy with what the fin with with what the financial services folks have done, um, and 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 as a and what they've been pushed to do in terms of limiting consumer liability, that's made them better at detecting fraud. I understand that, um, but boy, that strikes me as one industry. You know, relatively. I mean, there's different ways to to implement credit card fraud, but you're really talking about credit card fraud in an already regulated business. And if you think about all the different ways that, that folks can breach networks, breach data, and so on and so forth, and all the different types of companies that are out there, and all of the data that we're exchanging among our companies, it starts to feel harder to me that you could put in place one thing that would, um, that, that would be the right incentive and that you could <laughs> then keep, that you could then adapt as things change change so fast and it, the way things are going these days when we debate legislation I mean it, it, it would it would bypass us by the time we'd get to something so so those are just a few those are, I haven't thought about this question a lot but those are a few of my thoughts so you know uh, chairman Ramirez I mean um, you know the the, the identity test fast forward had put together two recommendations um, the first is that the federal government should work to better educate the private sector about safeguarding data, which I think is you know, really important, and that the government and the FTC in particular should initiate investigations of data security violations. So you know, with that in mind, there are, um, there are there obviously been a lot of work being done at the, at the federal level and in the private sector as well, I mean, really across the board on data security, on safeguarding data and those kinds of things. I think the thing that's you know, come out most recently, we have the NIST cybersecurity framework, for example, that's coming out that's looking at um, cybersecurity in the critical infrastructure. I think everybody believes that that framework should be applicable across a much broader um, uh, a much broader part of the business ecosystem than just you know transportation, electricity, the financial services. That there's a lot of small and medium-sized businesses in this country handling enormous amounts of data, and they need to be participate in this. We know from our own research and others do as well that you know uh, small and medium-sized businesses have a not such a great track record uh, in this arena, right? I mean, they really don't. Um, so back to sort of the the incentive question, though. You know. Um, we know that the administration has been looking at certain kinds of incentives, whether it's a broader adoption of things like cyber liability insurance, right, that might provide some way to, you know, remediate or recover after an incident. Um, is there um, anything that the FTC can do to um, better incentivize people to, you know, take data security more seriously and actually implement it? So, you know, this, this is an area where I think a lot more work does need to be done. done. Um, and let me just talk a little bit about, about this issue of diagnosing the problem. When you um, look at, um, just by way of example, if you look at um, Verizon's um, data breach report, um, that da data tells us that, the, and this is very much consistent um, and in line with what we see um, at the FTC, um, the significant portion of data breaches are ones that really reflect very basic mistakes when it comes to security. Um, and, and we still continue to see a lot of very fundamental mistakes. So it's clear to me that we need to do more by way of outreach, making sure that small, medium-sized companies know what they need to do and really understand the importance of data security. So I do think a lot of work needs to be done, both in terms of just uh, making, uh, educating and providing the resources so that they can avail themselves of um, just very basic measures. 
um, to protect the data that they have. Um, and then, then the other thing that, that I, I do feel needs to be done is something that I've already mentioned. I, I think it's, it is important for there to be um, legislation in this area. I think it would be helpful to have uh, federal legislation addressing the topic. I do feel this is an area where it would be helpful for us to have um, civil penalty authority um, because given the amount of data that is today being collected um, by companies from consumers, it's really critical that they understand that they need to have reasonable measures in place. And, and you know, what we, what we tell um, folks is, you know, the more sensitive the information you have, then the greater amount of security that's needed. Um, but given what we see and given um, the statistics that I've seen, it's clear that a lot more work still remains to be done in this area. Yeah, it, it, you know, we, we certainly have supported, um, you know, the FTC in general has supported that kind of, you know, adopting that kind of national standard for, for quite some time, and I think, and I think that's fine, and I, and I think it's um, good to think about it as reasonable under the circumstances because methods of breaking in keep changing, as, do our, as does our ability to stop it, remediate it, and, and, and so forth. So um, it would have to be some, a standard that can be adapted. Absolutely, and, and we certainly understand that um, we're not aiming for perfection, but, but again, what we see is that there are just certain basics um, that um, need to become much more widespread. So, um, you know, that's sort of the business side of, of the house, but we, and we've, we've sort of talked a little bit about the consumer side of the house as well, but um, clearly they play a role, right, um, in, in this, uh, in the prevention piece uh, specifically. You know, you, you raised the, the Verizon uh, data breach report, and I think, um, you know, they were, uh, you know, talking about, you know, over a billion customer records that have been affected by data breaches since 2004. These are big numbers. These are, you know, um, there are, you know, not that many people in the country, so we're, you know, we're talking about, you know, far-reaching uh, 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 incidences of, of, of these happening. Um, so can we ask consumers to do more? Um, can we be doing a better job around things, whether it's on passwords or implementing multi-factor authentication or ensuring that their systems are, you know, running the latest and greatest of any softwares, uh, both, you know, not only security, but, you know, core softwares that are in their systems where a lot of these vulnerabilities exist? Um, and are there, or are there other ways that we can harden some of these targets um, and make the, you know, the data less vulnerable? Um, a absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, and Debbie said this at the very beginning, I think one of her first words were, look, this is a, a, an, an issue, a very significant problem that has to be tackled on numerous levels. Consumers clearly are a critical piece. Um, consumers need to be aware. Um, they need to take steps to protect their own information. They have to have strong passwords. All, all of the tips that we, we give to consumers. Um, and in addition, they also need to be um, better armed with resources um, if they are if they do find themselves as victims of identity theft. And I, I touched on some of that, but, I, but let me just expand on, I think, um, some of the uh, more significant resources that are available to consumers today than even just um, a few years ago. And um, I talked about what we do at the, at the FTC. We really do place a you know, huge priority on that counseling um, folks. Um, the, the states and, and local law enforcers also um, use NITVAN as another mechanism of, of providing assistance to um, consumers. Um, uh, the financial sector as well is taking, um, is, has also made an effort to provide more in this area. Um, ITAC in particular um, has done, I think, a fair amount when it comes to assisting um, victims of, of ID theft. And then I also want to mention some nonprofits um, they do a lot of terrific work, ITRC. Um, we at the FTC often refer um, consumers um, to them as well if they need more assistance in dealing with their you know, credit reporting agency, dealing with a particular company. So um, clearly more can be done, but I think um, we are better equipped and we are doing a better job today to get the message out, both in terms of um, how do you prevent ID theft as well as how do you deal with it um, if, if you've um, been a victim. Yeah, and um, <laughs> those of you who are here who <laughs> worked with me in the past will not be surprised to hear me say, you know, 
I think it begins absolutely with the consumer. I think, um, you know, if you look at the surveys today and you see that consumers feel more out of control with their data, which I understand um, because there's a lot more of it being created, um, then let's help them feel a little more in control of that. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's such a tough area because we know that there's plenty of simple things that we all could do that we sometimes ignore in the name of expediency, right? And if you ask consumers to trade off expediency and when you know buying something for, like, they'll always say, my privacy is super important to me. It's way up here. And then you say, okay, well, but we could better protect your privacy if we do X, but that'll slow you down a little bit in buying what you want or getting on the site or app you want. The answer is no. I don't want to be slowed down, <laughs> generally speaking. Um, and so, and so we have to find a way, um, you know, to continue to, I, I think, for consumers to see that there's a lot that is in your control. Not everything, and I don't suggest it. Yeah. Right? I said it's got to be. It's, there's a lot of component parts, but I do think we shouldn't give up on that. And I worry about it a lot. With, um, you know, it's like. None of us sitting in this room, now I can't see everybody. There might be some people out there who are in their teens, but I doubt it. And, you know, I, like, they're at school I, today. I don't know about you. Yeah. Oh, they're actually there. Oh, good, good. Um, I don't feel like I, in any way, shape, or form, own the digital space and the internet. They own it. And the thing that worries me is, um, you know, are we getting at people at the right time yeah. to really, to, to, to put into their habits how to think about this. Um, for heaven's sake, they think the whole thing should be free, right? So, so we have to get them um, sort of understand. So, so I, do, you know, I do have some concerns there, but I don't think we should give up on it. And it's funny, I will tell you that um, companies are really working on this because what we know is that small habits and things make a huge difference. It seems like it doesn't, it does. It's not that hard to get into someone's system through a mistake, someone clicking on something they shouldn't click on. You know, hopefully we, we try we, to put in place defense mechanisms so we can quickly detect that that's happening and shut down that part of the network or whatever, but it does happen. So, um, so this is great. You know, C Carolyn and Heather, you know, this, this will crack you up. So you know what companies are doing now? They're doing exactly what we used to do with fake phishing things. And we're all doing that in our companies now. And, we're, and it was so funny because we had this huge debate in Procter whether we should do it. And that's where you, know, you send it, something to your people and you see how many people click on it when they shouldn't. And we had this huge debate in Procter because it is a company where you know, we have a lot of trust in each other and so forth that how would people feel when they realize they've been had and so on and so forth. And my view was, well, too bad. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is too important and they need to understand how important it is. So, the other day, I heard from a CEO who said that not only do they do they do this, they send it to their top executives, and then at their executive team meeting, they post how everybody did. <laughs> and, and so you want to talk about you know peer pressure to to, to be and think because think about it. I mean, these are some of the busiest people in the company. You get something you're like what's this click? I mean, you know, and, and you've got to stop and think for a second before before you do it. So um, so I think. Um, all that by way of saying that, you know, employee base, mm -hmm. um, which is another big constituency, is something we're all, we're all working on with training and, let's face it, being had <laughs> is something you'll never forget. <laughs> so that's why the fishing thing that I remember Carolyn and her team coming up with was, is, can, be, can be so effective. So. Yeah, they do say, you know, a lot of the security people say, you know, we can get rid of, uh, with just good high hygiene, right? And get rid of a lot of the threats. I mean, that's really, you know, one of the, one of the core pieces. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very dear, near and dear to us as a cybersecurity organization, you know, the, the shared responsibility around the security, which really falls not only in one place, but across the board. I, I, I think it's a great way to put it. That is, that is one of the tough things, is to think about it in terms of shared responsibility mm -hmm. within your organization. And then the fact is, because it's all getting so interconnected, we're ending up with a shared responsibility that's even broader, right? Yeah. Because all of our, because so much of our, um, you know, I think about all the suppliers and third parties that just we work with. Um, it's extraordinary. Yeah, and even your customers, uh, oh. you know, participate at some level mm -hmm. as well. Uh, at every level of the yeah. chain, yeah. Uh, it's a lot of a lot of network. 
So we're going to go on to some Q&A in a second here, but let me just, you know, I'll ask this question before we do. Um, you know, identity theft really is an interesting issue in a lot of ways because it stands, you know, kind of like on the cusp of both security and privacy, right? It's, it's you know, and, and we like to think of security sometimes and privacy as being really, you know, very deeply related, right? You can't have privacy if data's not secure, right? And you can't be secure, you know, if information's flowing out of your organization. So um, when you think of these, these are two big issues historically for the FTC, right? I mean, these two issues and where, and where this combines. So when you think about the role of the FTC in these two areas, um, just, you know, sort of reflecting on your tenures, how has that evolved or evolving, and, and maybe evolved in your case and evolving? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. We've already touched on this um, in some of the discussion earlier, but I really think, um, um, again, I, I think uh, the work that, that um, both uh, Tim Muris did in this area when it comes to data security, um, the decision um, that Debbie made to build on that. Um, I already mentioned um, creation of this special unit devoted to privacy, identity protection, um, data security, that was really quite critical. And, and today, it's an even more important part of what the agency does. It's, it's certainly a top priority of mine, and um, you know, it, it becomes ever more important. And clearly, consumers really care about privacy. We know that, uh, and, and, every, and, and sur surveys consistently um, show that. So that's you know, quite, quite crucial. Um, and we also are just more adept at dealing with the issues. We, in, at the, in terms of the, what the agency has done, in addition to having um, the division devoted to this, um, we also have, uh, we now have a chief technologist at the agency. This was something that uh, my immediate predecessor, John Leibowitz, um, started. Um, and and Latanya Sweeney is going to be starting joining us um, this coming month. And we also just have more technologists generally within the agency. We, we are recru actively recruiting attorneys who, have, who are knowledgeable about technology. Um, and we also have a mobile lab. Um, in the uh, at the agency where we're we're monitoring what's happening and and doing our best to identify the emerging trends because it's it continues to be an issue um, and this is something that we need to stay on top of. Um, frankly, you know the the amount of data that we see um, uh, companies amass today that issue is only going to become more and more pervasive as time goes on. So it's critical for the agency to get on top of it. And, and we address these issues um, in all of the ways that we've been talking about. Um, we have to make sure that um, consumers are educated, knowledge, knowledgeable about what's ha taking place, that they make informed choices about how they use their information, to whom they give their information. Um, that they know how to deal with problems at the back end if there are problems, that the private sector um, understands the importance of protecting privacy and, and protecting data security, um, and also that as enforcers that um, we um, continue to be vigilant in watching the marketplace and that we take action where it's appropriate um, and that we continue to highlight um, the importance of all of these issues. Yeah, and as I give you and the team, you know, so much credit for continuing to keep this, actually put it, as you say, even even higher on the hierarchy of things that are really important, and also um, to continue to hold the workshops and things that help understand what's going on. Because I'll tell you, as I look back on it and think about privacy generally and then data security as a component to promote privacy, I guess is kind of how I would say it. Um, a couple of things. One, I still find consumers' thoughts about privacy to be really fascinating. It's, it's hard to mm -hmm. pin down at any one time, and when you're at the FTC and you work for the consumer, I mean, I'm at Procter now, I can ask the CEO and others, what are you trying to achieve? What do you want, right? And then I can try to see whether we can help them achieve it, but, you know, when you work for consumers, we're all different. I mean, and so it's, it's very, very, it's very hard to understand, and and so, um, so there, I don't think there's any question that when we really started to get into this in a big way, that we were most focused on financial harm that comes out of some kind of privacy breach. Um, now, 
there's other kinds of threats to privacy, right? There's consumers feeling threatened because they don't want everybody knowing what their buying preferences are or something. Um, not all consumers feel that way, some do. So, so there's other forms of privacy to think about, but at the time, we were, we, in, especially in a world of limited resources and with all the sort of uh, data breaches we were seeing, we really were most focused on um, uh, privacy breaches that would result in financial harm. And I'm not saying that's all there is, but that's really where we had to put our resources. Because there's no question that while consumers might feel differently about other forms of what they might or might not consider an invasion of privacy, nobody wants their identity <laughs> stolen. And you, you know what I mean? So we sort of had to start there. So then as I see that evolution that you asked about, um, sort of t getting toward the end more of mm -hmm. my tenure, Edith, that was when more of the issues around, um, uh, d you know, directed advertising and, and, and that sort of thing started to come mm -hmm. more. And so the interesting thing about that is now working for the largest advertiser in the world, <laughs> um, you know, I'm really very focused, mm -hmm. you know, on, on, um, on those issues and how sure. that's all evolving. And I'm still vexed by exactly what it is um, uh, that, that, that consumers want in the, mm -hmm. in the space. And naturally, we all focus on giving consumers the choices that they want, um, provided they want. You know, sometimes you hear from consumers, I don't even want to have to check a box. Just, just behave responsibly. Don't make me, you know, decide. So, so I, you know, so, so, to, so to me, that's, um, you know, the, the, the trick for, uh, the trick for Edith and the team mm -hmm. that they're well up to, but it's you still got the financial side, and now there's a lot sure. of other there's a lot of other issues because there's just more and more ways to collect data, to use data, and from the consumer side, a voracious appetite to be able to um, uh, communicate on all, in all sorts of different ways, um, and um, and still then have the the protections that they want. So it's it's uh, it's it's a tough one, and it's going to continue to evolve. John, I don't know if we have any questions for us. Um, I guess I will. Uh, I'll continue on here. Um, you know, uh, you, and you and uh, Chairman Ramirez, you, you raised this earlier about sort of traditional law enforcement, you know, and, and their involvement. And it seems to me that you know, in in most cases, right, if you're a, a crime victim or something happens to you, uh, you would, you know, your first thing is to, you know, call your local police department, right? I mean, it's in your community. That's the people who are tasked with responding to crimes. Um, yet in ID theft, you know, we have these other channels where um, reports come in, you know, to the FTC or maybe into the IC3, you know, that they're coming in around sort of that traditional, which can lead to a host of other, I mean, could really lead to, to better service in some ways, but it also means maybe, you know, we don't really know always what's going on at the local level or, um, or that they're not uh, picking up cases that they could be really helping with. So is, is, should we be looking at that? Should we be looking at, at, at strengthening um, down at the local level, or maybe even the state and local level, how identity theft gets addressed, not only by law enforcement, but I think, you know, by the community at large. Um, you know, in other cases, we do support um, victims, you know, whether it's domestic violence or other things, with real underlying community supports that, that help them. Um, is that a direction we need to move in? You know, I think this is an area that I mean we're already you know involved yeah, in, yeah. and 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 you've reminded me that I've neglected to mention an important. Um, part of the role that the FTC plays, and that's um, the, the database that we, we have, of course, um, uh, the Identity Theft Clearinghouse. We're collecting um, complaints, and we make those complaints accessible to more than 2,000 uh, law enforcers across the country. So we are engaged on that, uh, and I had mentioned earlier also in terms of just the federal level coordination, that also includes um, talking to U.S. attorneys around the country who themselves then are connected with other local and state law enforcers. So I think there is a significant, um, this is, it's already happening, um, and local and state law enforcers certainly have access to the information that we're gathering. Um, and that's key. But it's also very important, of course, for us at the federal level to stay very much attuned because when there is, you know, we do have the, you know, substantial resources that can be brought to bear. Um, and just by way of example, and I think it goes, goes to the, the way that I started, the point that I was making, which is I think that we're, we're better um, equipped just in terms of the networks that we have in place to tackle this, even if it continues to be a problem and we have to remain vigilant and become 
ever more effective in tackling it. But just by way of example, last year, um, as I'm sure a number of you are aware, you know, South Carolina um, had a, a breach, their Department of Revenue had a very significant breach where more than four million um, social security numbers ended up being implicated. Um, we were able to provide assistance, and that included, you know, at the federal level. And we're we're going to be in a position to um, bring other federal law enforcers and provide assistance where it's needed. So I think you really want to have that federal level involvement, given the resources that are available to us. Um, you, you know, again, the FTC, the Department of Justice, FBI, all these other resources. Um, are quite critical, um, but of course we absolutely have to engage with our partners um, at the local level, and and um, and not just with enforcers, but also with uh, legal services organizations, community services organizations, the folks that are on the ground hearing directly from consumers um, who may not necessarily think of about the FTC and communicating with us directly. So it's it really is just this multi-pronged effort. Um, um, everyone has an important role, and, and of course, the consumer uh, piece is quite critical, as we've already discussed. And, and we're going to continue to work on all of those aspects at the FTC. I wonder if the police academies teach anything about this. You know, just you know, and I can't. Uh, there is a, a lot. Again, I mentioned this earlier. That all the training that, that we've undertaken. Um, so we've really made an effort to highlight this among enforcers about how important it is. So, but no question that I think, you know, ideas. Anybody who has you know great ideas about how we can better be be you know better about um, what we're doing and be more effective. Um, by all means, I'm all ears. I'm always in you know in discussing and even in thinking about um, today's event. Um, talking through with staff. So, you know, what more do we need to be doing? And so um, I'm always open to um, hearing, you know, good ideas um, from whatever source, uh, whether it's private sector, um, any of the folks who are in this room, I'm happy to hear them. So we only have, uh, we only just have a couple minutes left. Um, and I, uh, uh, I got one question from the audience. I don't know if, if, if you, you know, it, it, we've been talking a lot about um, sort of, you know, this is an issue. But there's a very human side to this as well, right? Um, and, and that's really, I think, always important to remember. We can talk about the big numbers, 16 million here, 24 billion there, you know, and that gives us a scope of the problem. But it really boils down at the end of the day, kind of the individual. So somebody asked, uh, the FTC collects a lot of data about ID theft. Is there an individual story, you know, that you've heard about a person or that, that really resonates with you? And maybe that's a nice way to end sort of on the personal side. You know, I think we um, we often hear from consumers um, where we're able to provide, you know, um, ha have a direct impact, um, whether it's in terms of the outreach that we've made available. Um, and I really think that having a hotline where you can talk to someone who can provide you guidance, I think that is really very, very helpful. Um, also, on the, on the enforcement side, we often hear stories about, you know, how folks are appreciative that we, you know, have taken action. Um, so something you know that brings certainly me great pleasure when we really um, when we hear that human human element and, and human side because as you said, you know um, it, this is a problem that really is you know very very harmful to consumers. And in, in reading the um, the uh, BGA's, uh, BGA uh, statistics that came out just today, I mean, the numbers are just quite astounding, and, and I absolutely understand that there are individual stories behind those staggering numbers, 16.6 .6 million Americans affected by ID theft. So, um, frankly, that's really what, you know, what drives me to look for better and better ways of tackling these, these issues and these problems. Could, could I really quickly, two sure. quick stories. I, you know, like you, I never want to get too far away from, you know, the, it's so easy to talk about consumers as this amorphous, you know, group. And, and one time, um, my, my sister, who was running a local chamber of commerce in a tiny little town in Indiana, asked me if I were going to be in Chicago or somebody nearby if, if I would mind coming and speaking. And so I finally um, had a chance to do it. And I, and I talked about this issue with them. And then um, afterward, every single person who was there from all these different counties lined up to come and talk to me. And it was absolutely, I mean, I, I, Anybody who knows me knows I get really hungry, and I was standing there ready to pass out. But the, <laughs> but I listened to every single one of them. And the one guy, the one guy was so cute. He told me about a story about how his identity had had been stolen, and and I, and I think it, it manifested in credit card fraud for him. 
and, and the steps he took, and, and he kept saying, but, 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 I, but perhaps you've heard about my case. And, uh, <laughs> and I, said, I said, oh, sir, we get 20,000 contacts a week on identity yeah. theft, so, so, but I know about cases like yours, you know. And then the other little funny story I remember is that when, um, when President Bush was announcing the formation of the task force, and then Attorney General Gonzalez and I went with some other law enforcement folks um, to, to meet with him on it, um, we thought that um, it would be a great idea to bring some identity theft victims mm -hmm. with us so that he could hear um, because he was definitely somebody who wanted to know the effect on the people. So, so we bring these people in and naturally, what do you think? You think, well, we'll bring like some of the worst cases. And they were cases where, for example, someone got detained at the border and then thrown into jail for a night over a, a stolen identity. You know, really just bad stuff. Um, and, and so people are telling their stories to, to President Bush. But unfortunately, it backfired on me. I'm sitting to his left, and he keeps saying, Deb, I thought you were taking care of this. <laughs> what are you doing over there at the FTC? <laughs> so I walked out of the White House that day like, oh. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, whoever asked the question, it's a great, it's a great yeah. question. So. So, uh, Chairman Ramirez, Debbie, thank you so much. It was a terrific uh, conversation. We really appreciate it. Thank you.